Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sophia, and I am the local shorts programmer. Um, I am joined by four of our, uh, well, look, before four of our local shorts filmmakers and one of our lead actors. Um, we have uh, Milad Moafa, who is the director of Five Minutes and also the lead actor in that film, Adrian Benson. Um, we also have Joe Elliott, who is the director of Chili for Two, and we have Brayden Dragomir, who is the director of The Common Thread. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I think I'll start out with uh, Milad and Adrian, and we'll kind of circle around with the questions. Um, so can you guys just like start us out by telling us kind of what, how did you guys uh, uh, kind of come on to this project and uh, what interested you about it and, and what was your collaboration process like? You want to start, Adrian, or should I go? Then. This is the, yeah, you, you start. And I'll um, jump in. Uh, sure. I mean, what, what um, I came across a, a statistic a long time ago that really fascinated me. Um, you know, the, the film, this film is not about adultery, but uh, adultery plays a role in, 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 in the narrative. It's very intertwined in it. Uh, and that statistic was that uh, Adultery basically occurs in one way or another in the overwhelming majority of relationships and marriages. And, um, but also um, over 90% of those who were polled considered adultery to be morally wrong and they condemned it at a statistically much higher rate than many other things, including polygamy and suicide. So it was very intense because most people seem to do it, but they're so against it. Yeah. Um, and so before five minutes, I made another short film called The Scene, which was also you know, involved adultery. And that film assumed his protagonist, not the cuckold, you know, the one who's getting cheated on or the adulterer, the one who's cheating, but rather the love interest, you know, the third party. Um, and with five minutes, I also um, wanted to, to address or tackled this topic from a slightly different angle. I didn't want to judge the affair or focus on why the lady is having an affair and who with and the type of affair that she's having. I wanted to sort of fo focus on the personal guilt uh, and the role that the guilt could have in redefining the relationship. Uh, and so um, the project was a very simple budget. It was, it was the first piece that I was going to be directing that wasn't written by me. And for me, that was a challenge. Uh, something that I always wanted to do, and Bita Judaki, she had written a very interesting script that sort of spoke to me, um, and I knew it had to be a simple project because I was paying for it entirely out of pocket, and at that time, Adrian and I um, had met at York University doing the master's film production program, um, and I thought, uh, this guy, this guy could be, this guy could, yeah. <laughs> I could see him as as yeah. as the husband, yeah, yeah. And so it was actually the first time I'd worked with an actor who I knew outside of the scope of just being an actor. Well, see, I yeah, I didn't yeah. actually know that. That's a cool, uh, that's a cool fact. Because see, I yeah, I know Milad, you know, in in the program, and we had become friends and collaborators, sort of you know, in classroom settings, just you know, colleagues and classmates. But I think when I got you know, I'd seen Milad's work. I was like, it'd be so cool to work with him in some way. And I thought that was going to be hold a boom mic or <laughs> do some, you know, yeah, some gaffing or something. But then it, when it was, oh yeah, you'd be great for this, uh, this particular role. I thought this would be so much fun. And uh, turns out it was, I was right. Yeah. Yeah, and Adrian, you kind of, <laughs> you kind of play almost, I mean, you play the same person, but almost, mm -hmm in two separate roles, like the fantasy right. version and the, the real life version. I'm kind of mm -hmm. wondering how, um, how do you like balance kind of the, the comedy of the fantasy version and the, um, you know, the sort of very like mm -hmm. realistic dramatic aspect of this, uh, this performance? Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Cause I, th I think the, the roles were so clearly defined by Milad as like, these are separate situations and placing me in that, you know, contextualizing each scene helps. But I think the key is just not to intellectualize it. It's just, you're playing that scene as as sort of what it calls for in the moment and not trying to think, well, how is this connecting to real life? Because ultimately, you know, you've seen the film if you're watching this q and I hope it'd be an interesting uh, reversal, but to spoil it, you know, you get a character who, this is the over the top characters being imagined through uh, like the, the 
lead female character's mind. So it's not really who I am. So in a way I did sort of approach it like the same two different characters, uh, but with wearing the same clothes and looking exactly the same and talking the same. It's just, it, it helped me knowing that I could kind of go way bigger and then retreat and knowing that this was different character, didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, so I'm going to move on to Joe. Um, so your film Chili for Two is the shortest film in our program by far, um, which I actually really like about it. And um, it's only two minutes long. And I was kind of wondering, uh, first of all, like what prompted you to kind of keep things so short? And um, were there kind of any challenges involved in that? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me with this. This is happy to be here, but it just seemed like the right length for it. Um, I have a habit of making very small short films. I think my longest is nine minutes and I, it's too long, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, a lot of my favorite films are very short, like a few minutes long, uh, be it more experimental pieces or comedy or whatever it might be. I mean, uh, I just am drawn to the format and I think I'm interested in having like a small experience represent a much larger experience. So like if you have something that's two minutes long in the film, you only get a little glimpse of mostly one character but a, like and his friend and you don't get to know really what happened before or what happened after but hopefully by seeing this little impression you like as an audience can maybe bring yourself to it a little bit more not literally think what happened to this guy before this movie started but you kind of fill in the gaps i think emotionally and then you as an audience make things feel bigger so that's I like that kind of stuff. I read more short stories than novels. I just, I'm drawn to it. Uh, and then as like as a director, it's great because you not only can you work outside of like traditional narrative structures, like you have to, you can't fit three acts into two minutes. It doesn't work. So you have to try and find another way to basically get the audience's attention and hold it. But thankfully you only have to hold it for a few minutes so you can get a little more unconventional with your structure, which is both very interesting and also sort of challenging because sometimes you get to the end of the, the process and I've, I've done this before where you look at it and you think, oh, that really is, it's not, there's not much there. You know, you try and take a really small idea, like the smallest thing you can and hope that that little thing will feel big when you're done. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I think this one turned out okay, but um, I don't know, I just, I find that really interesting and I it's just it's like the only kind of thing I can write is like two to five minutes <laughs> yeah yeah I noticed you also um you you kind of say a lot with music in this film could you kind of expand a little bit um on on that like how that informed the film uh that helps a lot because the music obviously like grabs you emotionally uh immediately right so it certainly helps in that small little window to have something that hooks you so quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, The song is by uh, Ivan Rivers, who is a great, great folk musician living in Guelph. He's an old friend of mine. And I don't know that I don't normally think about music while writing, but in this situation, there were sort of two ideas. There's the guy carrying the pot of chili down the street. I thought that was funny. And I'm like, I got to do something with that. And I heard his song, which he'd released an EP at the same time. That's the first track on the EP. And I'm like, oh, that's the second half. So I asked him and he was all right with it. So uh, I don't normally work so explicitly to a single piece of music, but in this case, it just timed out nicely and it made it easy because you hear this song at the same time that the character's hearing this song. So you're emotionally getting, like you can connect to him very, very quickly. You get a sense of like all of a sudden this, uh, all of the baggage and stuff he's been going through that you don't get to see because again, it's two minutes long and the song starts like a minute into the film. Um, So you've known this guy for one minute, but I think the song helps grab you and uh, sort of helps you understand who he is and what he's been going through in seconds, you know, and it helps that it's a great song. Yeah, definitely. Yes, I, I, uh, (laughs) now that you said it, uh, sorry, what's his name? Because I will definitely add it to my uh, Spotify. (laughs) Ivan Rivers. Ivan Rivers, uh, okay. Definitely look him up. He's got a bunch of EPs and they're, all great. Awesome. Um, so I'll, I'll go to you, Brayden. Um, so what drew you to um, Heather as a subject and kind of what was your collaboration process like with her? Well, so it started 
um, you know, probably like four or five years ago, we did a project with her sister, uh, Whitney Haynes, who's a silversmith. And so I'm not from Kingston originally. And so I wasn't exposed to Heather or her work, um, but a lot of people have been. And so my introduction to her was kind of through her sister. Um, and, and so Whitney told us one day, she was like, oh, you should like talk to my, my sister about what she does. And so it was a few years later, we reconnected. I think it was kind of around the middle of last year um, and just started learning about her work and what she had been doing. Um, and it, you know, it sort of instantly became pretty fascinated with it. It's a, it's a pretty, it's an interesting story to go from being a successful artist who's selling a ton of paintings to that work feeling like a commodity and then like running away to Africa to just get away, you know, and that sort of put this massive pivot in the middle of her career. And so, you know, that aspect tied to the work that she's been doing was just, it was it was kind of one of those things that became a little bit too interesting to to not try to do something with. Yeah. And kind of how long did did you work with Heather? How long was kind of the the interview process with her? So the we filmed it. Well, you know, <laughs> I think like we said before, everyone watching this has probably seen the film, so you can kind of see how the structure looks. Um, but so we filmed the painting of the piece that is sort of the consistent visual through line all the way through the film. We filmed that over seven sessions. And so, you know, we'd spend eight hours with her a day on those days and we would just sort of be there all the way through the process, kind of whatever she was working on, we were filming um, and we had a mic on her the whole time. And so, you know, we learned very quickly, she doesn't talk much when she works because she just, she gets super into that, you know, that flow state. And so we sort of disappear. Um, and so through that process, we would just sort of poke and prod and just ask, you know, why are you doing this? Or where is this going? Or what inspired this? And just kind of prodded through that whole process. And then, um, so that would have been probably September until November of last year. And then we did the interview in January. And so the interview was basically a culmination of everything we had learned. We, you know, we took it's challenging in a short film to take like 14 years of someone's life and condense it down into, you know, a short period of time that is engaging on screen. Um, and, you know, I think we're in that, like, we're in that dangerous length of a short film where it, it kind of just ended at 20 minutes. And we were like, oh, this is, it's kind of too long to be a short, but too short to be a long. Um, <laughs> but it's, but we also sort of live by the, the mantra that, it needs to be as long as it needs to be to tell itself. And if we were cut, we, we tried making it shorter and it, and it hurt the story. And so, you know, we ended up staying where we were. But yeah, yeah, it was eight filming sessions of the painting. And then there's a handful of scenes we sort of built in to it throughout. Um, and we did those as we sort of figured out that we needed something visually to move us through something that happened, you know, 12 years ago or eight years ago. And it was finding scenes that we could um, not recreate, but represent sort of like the emotion or the tone of what was happening at that moment of time. So it sort of took us about four months to film everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, I am kind of wondering, um, like, is there, um, from what we've seen, like, is there any anything uh, further that you would do with this project? I was thinking maybe um, she, she talks about the um, the young girl who's taking photos for her now. Is, is there anything um, kind of in the future for that that maybe we don't see in this film? Yeah, so the dream is to turn this into a feature length. Um, and we wanna do that by telling the Congo side of the story. The challenge we've had sort of through this whole project is it's only Heather's perspective. And so what we decided to do was really lean into her story and her process and sort of the more purpose side of her work. But my hope is that we can, um, we can you know, go and try to find some funding for this. And I wanna go tell Kazingu's story, who is the, you know, you sort of, I guess you meet Kazingu halfway through this film, um, but he started the orphanage that is in the Congo. Um, and he now takes care of 144 kids. One of the kids who's in that, um, in that center is his daughter. 
And his daughter is, is Lucienne, who is Heather's new collaborator, who's been taking photos in the Congo and sending them to her. And she's learning how to take over running the center. And so it will sort of be a, a two generation Congolese story on that end. And so my hope is that we can tell Kazingu and Lucienne's story and sort of make it a three act story through these, you know, sort of two families from different worlds that have, whose, you know, sort of narratives have become so intertwined. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be super cool. And maybe, maybe when, when that comes up, we'll be able to see um, that at, at KCFF in future years. I think that would be really cool. Um, I, I'm super excited about it. So I, I can't yeah. wait to try to make it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so unfortunately we are running out of time here. Uh, we only have, uh, but maybe I'll just, I did have one kind of um, last question for Milad. Um, so I did kind of ask Adrian about comedy and, and drama, and I was wondering if you could, I know that um, you did you say you'd work with a, another uh, screenwriter on this project, um, but kind of tell us about how, about how um, kind of why you um, chose to approach the topic of, of cheating from this angle and kind of blending those comedy and, and drama aspects and how you kind of went about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the interplay between comedy and drama or I guess between any sort of directly opposing ideas or at least I feel critical to the successful storytelling and also to ultimately to a more enjoyable experience for an audience. Uh, because without it, you know, the experience would be a bit monotonous. It's kind of like driving down a residential street and going to the highway and then going uphill and downhill without ever changing your gear or, you know, your coffee is bitter, but you complement it with something sweet. Um, and I think the comedies that uh, that work best for me are usually the ones that are mindful of that balance. You know, the funny ideas resonate a little bit more when you're holding up sort of a mirror against it. You know, all, all of Charles Chaplin's films, for instance, are, are filled with moments of sentimentality and, and, and even very successful serious movies, you know, Marriage Story or you know, I think Alexander Payne's, for instance, Sideways. You know, it's about a depressed character, but there's so many instances of comedy throughout to contrast that sadness. Otherwise, you know, we as viewers would get an overload of seriousness, uh, seriousness and it stops being digestible after a while. Um, so five minutes is divided into two sections. You know, the first half is more comedic and absurd because it takes place in the mind of the character and reflects her sort of state of semi-panic and paranoia. And the other half takes place in the real world. So it's more realistic and, and, and more serious. Um, and, and Bita's original script was just actually the first half. It was only the comedic section uh, where the character is imagining things. And so one of the first things I did actually was I wrote that second half. I wrote that final scene um, because I thought it was necessary to counterbalance the humor with something a bit more serious. Uh, and so I wrote in that scene to sort of uh, end the journey on a more balanced and sort of more rounded note uh, that helps us reflect on the comedy a little bit more. And then we can use the comedy to also reflect on the ending uh, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up now, but um, thank you all so much um, for joining us today and, and giving us your insights about your films. Um, uh, for our audience who will be watching uh, in the future, um, I will just like to say that uh, KCFF 2022 runs from March 3rd to 13th, and you can check out the other um, videos in this series to hear from all the other amazing local and Canadian filmmakers and talent. So thank you guys all so much for coming today. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thank you.